Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, Tony Kushner, I am sure, is known to all of you. Uh, Tony is the author of Angels in America, A Bright Room Called Day, Homebody Kabul, Carolina Change, the screenplay to Munich, which was made by Steven Spielberg, the screenplay to Lincoln, which is currently being made by Steven Spielberg, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, there's more in your program. There's more on the internet. Read it all. It's worth it. Uh, and Tony is also the author of a quite extraordinary introduction to a new edition of The Glass Menagerie. How did you come to write that uh, essay? Was it, is this the first, like, when Robert just said, is that the first moment that you realized that Jeremy isn't Paul Auster, or did you, <laughs> did you, <laughs> I just, oh my god. Um, all right, well, uh, how did I, they asked me to write it, and. Um, and you responded with. Uh, it's longer than, the, my introduction is longer than the play. It's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's 50 pages long, and it's incredible. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good play, there's a lot to say. About right, right, it. but what I, but what I, what I responded to is that you used, you, it started from The Glass Menagerie, but you managed to have, to have original things to say about O'Neill and about Miller and about the larger question of how we connect, how imagination and documentary fact coexist in a piece of work, um, which is one of the things we're supposed to talk about tonight. So it was excellent timing to have written this essay when you did. Right, I, we were thinking alike. I, I arrived, uh, planning to read the entire introduction. Um, uh, and Jeremy suggested instead that I read two paragraphs of it. Um, and then we'll use those as a springboard to talk about a number of things. Um, uh, the reason that O'Neill entered this uh, introduction, I mean, it's a really interesting moment in American playwriting when Glass Menagerie appears on the stage and, and really um, provides a kind of second revolution in uh, American uh, dramatic writing. I mean, the first being, of course, the advent of O'Neill in the 20s and early 30s. Um, but O'Neill, by this point, had fallen silent, really hadn't uh, had any kind of uh, important success since he won the Nobel Prize in the uh, late 30s and uh, was known to have had uh, Parkinson's disease. We don't know if he actually had Parkinson's or something else, but uh, he had stopped um, writing for a while, and then had uh, recently reappeared with um, Iceman Cometh, which was a big flop, and Moon for the Misbegotten, which was considered so poor that it wasn't even brought into New York. And uh, uh, no one knew that in 1939 he had already written A Long Day's Journey Into Night uh, because he didn't want anyone to read it uh, until 25 years after his death and, and wanted it never to be performed on any stage anywhere by actors. And uh, it was in, in a vault in Bennett Cerf's uh, office in Random House. And uh, the only person that had uh, read it other than Bennett Cerf at this point, uh, when Glass Menagerie appeared, was Carlotta O'Neill, his wife, who had typed it and to whom it's dedicated. So there's a kind of a weird um, retrograde motion in the history of American playwriting because uh, uh, we know that when Arthur Miller saw Glass Menagerie, he says, in many places, that's what gave him permission to start thinking about writing Death of a Salesman. And Death of a Salesman appears a couple of years later uh, after he saw Streetcar. Um, and, and that succession makes a certain kind of sense. What's, what's shocking is that uh, um, Long Day's Journey Into Night isn't done until 1956, after these plays that are clearly, uh, couldn't have been written, really, without O'Neill. But one always thinks of, you know, there's a nice orderly succession, and that is, in fact, chronologically what happened, that you have O'Neill writing uh, at the end of his life, his greatest play, maybe the greatest play written by an American, followed by Williams and Miller. And, and it, it works out that way chronologically, except Williams and Miller had no idea that O'Neill was still writing or that he had written Long Day's Journey. So it's a kind of a weird thing. But, uh, uh, Journey comes into the uh, consideration of Glass Menagerie because I felt when I was thinking about Glass Menagerie that it was a play, um, that, that the fact that it's a, it's a um, famously autobiographical play uh, made me think about the other famously autobiographical play, Long Day's Journey Into Night. Uh, O'Neill, as I said, pushed it away out of sight um, and only because his widow managed to get his will broken 
through fairly duplicitous uh, means, uh, was it performed in 56? It shouldn't have been performed technically until 1979 for the first, uh, I mean, it shouldn't have been read until 79 and then, as I said, never performed. Anyway, uh, so I, I'll just read these two paragraphs. Um, while all fiction must incorporate lived experience to be recognizable, to provoke empathy, there's a special anxiety attendant upon the fictionalizing of actual people and events. It grows in intensity the more firmly a work of fiction adheres to the non-fictional. This is partly a result of a fear of the ostensibly insalubrious effects uh, for the audience and artist of blurring the real and the unreal. Plato and Aristotle worried about the trivializing or subverting of history by presenting it on the stage. Beyond the communal responsibility to police the boundary between art and life lies the responsibility of the artist to a personal ethics of representation. At the heart of this ethics, concomitant with an understanding of the power of art that's central to the artist's creative impulse, is a fear of transgression through representation, the fear of the graven image, and the fear of art's power over memory and hence over human history, its violative potential threat to the living and the dead. Shakespeare's Cleopatra wanted to die before she'd be forced to watch herself recreated dramatically to see, from Shakespeare, some squeaking Cleopatra boy my greatness in the posture of a whore. So now, uh, right. why, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> Good night, everybody. So, uh, well, I was struck by that because uh, you did not shift into the first person when you were writing it, and yet there must be some element of personal experience behind that because on numerous occasions you have you have delved into uh, history for your characters and for the for the uh, incidents in your plays. So talk about the the, the personal ethics of representation. I mean, uh, we could take as an example, uh, maybe the best known example from your work here, uh, uh, Roy Cohn, uh, who is a, one of the central figures in Angels in America. How does that special anxiety you talk about manifest itself when you sit down at your writing table and you're about to depict yeah, well, I mean, the, the anxiety that I'm talking about in terms of uh, Williams and O'Neill mm -hmm. is, is an anxiety of taking your own family and putting them on stage. Uh, you have a special debt mm -hmm. to the dead. I mean, Roy Cohn was a really terrible person, and I feel, uh, I felt when I was writing Angels that I didn't owe him really anything at all. And, you know, I didn't have to make up anything to make him seem on stage like a really terrible person. Um, so how about uh, Caroline? I mean, Carolina well, changes. Well, that's a very different, yeah. uh, the, the woman on whom Caroline is loosely based is very much alive. She just had knee replacement surgery. Um, mm -hmm. And she's doing very well. Um, as her daughter said to me on the phone just a couple of days ago, she's very tough. She's a tough old bird as well. She didn't say bird, but anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 and, and uh, you know, there was a very different uh, feeling about that. I mean, the feeling when you're writing historical drama, I mean, I'm certainly feeling that a lot waiting for Lincoln. We finished filming it now and it'll be out in November. And, you know, there's going to be a great deal. And God knows we were run through the mill with Munich. Uh, what is the relationship of this work of fiction to historical fact? And, uh, and you know, there's been a great deal of interesting uh, talk about that recently, um, including uh, over a show at the public. I so, heard something about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, my, the, the sort of formula that I came up with in terms of historical fiction and the questions of historical fiction uh, when we were doing Munich was basically, um, did this thing happen uh, is the first question you ask. And if the answer is no, then it's a work of fiction, if the, or it's fiction. If the answer is yes, it happened, then it's history. Then the next question is, did it happen exactly like this, the way you're showing it? If the answer is yes, then it's a work of history. And if the answer is no, not exactly like that, then it's a work of historical fiction. And that's, that's I think, you know, sort of the rule that I've, I've gone by. I don't think that you have um, uh, uh, a responsibility to present something um, with a kind of uh, documentary, well, I mean, we all know, of course, that documentaries are manipulated up the wazoo, but uh, you don't have to uh, necessarily present something um, with, it, with the sort of uh, rigorous adherence to what's known about the past that one would expect from historical scholarship. 
Um, uh, there's always interpretation, but there are certain standards of you know, historicity that we would hope that historians are following. I mean, their works are judged valuable or less valuable, depending on how, you know, if you want to read a book about Abraham Lincoln written by Doris Kearns Goodwin or James McPherson, you, you can really pretty much count on the uh, scrupulousness of the historian. If you want to read a book about Abraham Lincoln by Bill O'Reilly, you know, <laughs> Zeigesund, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, I haven't, I haven't read Mr. O'Reilly's, so maybe I'm not being fair, but anyway. Um, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, so, you know, the, the, but I think that, that uh, you know, it, it, that's not to say that, that you have complete license to reinvent right. if you're writing historical fiction. I think you have to be able to say that the outcome, that the things that you've altered to suit your dramatic purposes um, aid in the work of historical fiction being useful in the understanding of history rather than in uh, providing an explanation for the outcome. Because if you've changed events, and you, then you're basically just writing uh, a lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lie anyway, because it's fiction. Right. But, you know, it's, uh, so, you know, um, Roy Cohn didn't have conversations with uh, uh, a closeted gay Mormon right. or the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg, and I, uh, <laughs> you know, so. Um, but with Lincoln, I'm guessing the bar is much higher. I'm guessing you're, you know, do you, did you find yourself, I know we can't talk about that much because it's not out, we haven't seen it yet, but we will, but do you, did you find yourself having to deny the, the dramatic impulse to put words in his mouth that you didn't think were substantiated by history? No, I mean, the, you know, the problem with Lincoln was sort of the opposite. I mean, uh, for one thing, we know so much about Lincoln. Uh, um, I mean, there's a book that's about this thick called Lincoln Day by Day, and that's exactly what it is. It's every single day of his life. <laughs> and, and the really horrifying thing is that you take any day, especially once he got to the White House, and you could make a, an 18-year-long television, well, not an 18-year-long, but you could easily make out of it, I said this to Spielberg when we were working on it, you could make a 10-part miniseries out of absolutely any week of his entire administration. Any week? Any week. There's literally not a week, there's barely a day when something so astonishing isn't happening right. that it wouldn't be the perfect subject for a feature-length film. I mean, it's the Civil War, you know? And uh, uh, James McPherson, when we were t getting ready to work on the film together, uh, McPherson said in this meeting of Lincolnists that we, ha that we assembled, um, McPherson wrote the uh, Battle Cry of Freedom, which is, I think, the... the history of the Civil War. You, was, you assembled like the, 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 uh, the elders, the wise men of Stephen, Lincoln Scholarship When too. Stephen was trying to convince me to, to write the movie, because I, I thought, well, this is, you know, why would you do this? It's like, as a friend of mine used to say, you know, stick your hand in a blender, it's faster. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, um, there, are, there are some human beings, uh, Shakespeare, Mozart, Michael, you know, there's some people who do uh, things that um, uh, just absolutely defy ordinary human comprehension. And we'll, we'll never understand. In fact, once you've explained how Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, uh, you've failed because, of course, you haven't explained how Shakespeare, you, we have no idea how anybody wrote that play. It doesn't, it's not possible. Right. Um, and there are a few people like that. And, uh, uh, you know, George Eliot. I mean, there, there, there are people who are just, you know, better than we are. And, uh, <laughs> and Abraham Lincoln, that's, you know, that's good yeah. uh, that they're, they're there. Um, because then we have things like the Divine Comedy or, or yeah. uh, St. Matthew's Passion. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we've Sweet. gotten a lot from these people. And Lincoln is on that level, I think. And, and I felt, well, I'll never understand how Lincoln did what he did. And I'm happy to say that at the end of six years of work on the screenplay, I, I never did. Uh, but I, did you come closer? Uh, well, I hope so, or at least I certainly found things. I mean, what you hope you can do then is not explain the genius. I don't know how he wrote the second inaugural address. I, I, I wish I knew how he did that. I would write it myself if I knew how. Um, uh, but uh, write the second inaugural address while running the country, and et cetera. Uh, I feel like we between Stephen and I and uh, Daniel was playing Lincoln and, mm. and the other amazing Daniel actors and, and, and everybody making the film, uh, 
we, I hope, have come up with something that's of real value. I mean, I feel very excited about it. The, um, but I was very nervous about it at first. So we, we pulled together this big group of uh, Lincolnists. Huh. So uh, stipulate that, that no one can ever fully explain it. There is no full explanation. But if I were to ask for a partial explanation, if I just said to you in front of, I don't know, a couple hundred people, I said, Tony, how did he do it? <laughs> you know, I mean, I think there are things that, that can be gleaned from his style of leadership, from his, uh, you know, but there's this scary part of him. Uh, the French have an expression of the coup, uh, coup d'oeil, um, uh, blow of the eye. I've, I read this in some book about Lincoln. Uh, uh, the, the ability to see sort of everything mm. from all sides all at once. And, and there's a, you find this in people writing about Lincoln, pretty much everybody comes to this place where they start to get kind of ooky spooky because there does seem to be um, a, a, a vision that's, that's less bounded by um, physical, uh, uh, it starts to make you think about, you know. And it's not, I mean, if you, you know, again, Hamlet, uh, yeah. uh, Don Giovanni, I mean, we, uh, an artist of immense genius, or, or you know Einstein, if you want to get into something that's not, uh, not uh, aesthetic. Uh, I mean, there are people who can look at the same reality that everybody else is looking at, and somehow the ground and the sky open up, and there's, they can see beyond. And uh, and he seemed to have had an ability to, you know. I mean, I think that there's a uh, a deep understanding of the nature of power in a democracy, um, uh, even though the, the questions of democracy during a civil, a violent civil war are, are imponderably difficult questions, but there's an adherence to a certain conviction about the nature of a people's democracy and what he was doing that I think gave him clarity about how to preserve the union and end slavery and I think both of which uh, I think he's so, largely responsible for. So six done. years, you spent six years working on it. What's it. What was it like or has it been like to leave the study or leave your writing table having spent time with Lincoln and then pick up the newspaper and see what's going on today and see American politics today? Does it, it must give you a different perspective maybe a different spe perspective than you had before, you know, more than six years oh, ago? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so? I was going to say the McPherson, the reason I brought him in is that he said in that meeting that the Civil War is such an immensely complicated landscape that even a figure the size of Lincoln can get lost in it. Mm -hmm. He was sort of warning us away from trying to get the whole war crammed in. And, uh, um, but at the end of that conference, I was still sort of in the corner somewhere going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And Doris Kearns Goodwin uh, pulled me aside and said, look, maybe what you're saying is right and you'll fail at doing this, I don't know. She said, when I started writing Team of Rivals, I felt that I might fail at it. But one thing I can promise you is you won't regret doing it because you'll get to spend however much time you work on this in the company of one of the greatest people that ever lived. And not just great in terms of august and you know, immensely impressive, but dear. You've, everybody who works on him falls in love with him, I think. Yeah. I mean, unless you're kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you really run into this phenomenon over and over again of people, you know, he, there, I mean, it sounds so cheesy to say it, but Lincoln is lovable. I mean, there's something, you know, you, you, you're, you're somebody who's, who's a, a great guy. Right. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, the people that are attracted to write about Lincoln are pretty great people. O'Reilly. Um, well, <laughs> starting with Bill O'Reilly. Um, uh, but, um, but, so, but your experience of... So what Dora said actually yeah. turned out to be the case. It, it, um, it changed my life working on this screenplay. Oh. And I'm really, I feel like one of the great gifts that I was given is that I got to work on it uh, um, through 2008 hmm. and the campaign. I was sitting next to my husband Mark on the couch on election night uh, with Linda Eamon, who was uh, the actress who was there with us watching, uh, watching the returns come in, frantically trying to finish a second rewrite before Stephen got 
fed up and fired me because uh, it was my first draft was 500 pages long and it took a long time to squeeze it down. Uh, yeah, I mean the average screenplay. It, the movie is going to be actually like I, you know a normal movie, but uh, I wrote a long uh, version first and. Uh, and I was working on it while I was watching this astonishing thing happening on television. And I, I'm sure that one of the reasons that, uh, I mean, I feel like I've watched the whole Obama presidency through the lens of thinking about and working, I'm mean, constantly working on, on the Lincoln script. And it's, it's given me uh, um, a, a very, very uh, deep conviction that Barack Obama is a great president, mm -hmm. that he's done an astonishing job, and that, uh, and that, that we are uh, um, in, uh, that he faced a, 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 I mean, Lincoln said when he left Springfield to go to uh, Washington, uh, in his farewell speech, he said, I, I go now to face a task greater than the task that faced Washington himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that Obama uh, entered office with a, a situation in some ways more daunting than any president's faced except possibly FDR and maybe since Lincoln himself I think the country because FDR after all faced a country that was in a certain sense uh, not completely unified the country will never be that but was far more unified through catastrophe than uh, I think the country that Obama uh, became president of and uh, I feel very um, I was fascinated in all the work I did on Lincoln about his relationship with the left, um, uh, and, and which was not a congenial relationship a lot of the time. And I feel that the, I've been uh, very concerned, because I'm a person of the left, uh, with the role of the left during the Obama, uh, the last four years, and, and what I've come to feel more and more uh, um, impatiently is a lack of understanding, or not a lack of understanding, but a comfort on the left uh, with powerlessness and with um, uh, being critics rather than creators. Uh, and, and, uh, and I feel like we may be in the process of, of uh, helping to author um, a, a new catastrophe and uh, um, which I believe is inarguably what you would call Mitt Romney becoming president of the United right. States. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's scary out there. I mean, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm old enough at 55 going on 56 to remember 1980, yeah. before, well before November. I certainly remember 1976 when people were, were just, cracking up at the idea that Ronald Reagan, this like tired old, you know, geezer Z level actor who <laughs> made movies with chimpanzees was gonna was running from it was like, oh, what will they come up with next? Those Republicans there just never uh, failed to amuse. And 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 <laughs> people had stopped laughing quite as hard by the early eighties, but we all sat around going, Oh yeah, just wait for him to make his next, you know, big confusion of illusionary and we, we sat there and then all of a sudden whoops there he was and and I mean you know he got there by committing high treason but I mean he did the, everybody has forgotten about you know um, the Iran Contra but anyway uh, uh, but you know it, he he got there is the point and uh, well the, the same thing happened even I mean I you know can't, I don't have clear memories of 1980, but even, it, it's funny, I, I have heard a few friends of mine on the left say to console themselves lately that, well, you know, Romney is not that bad. Romney is not, you know, it's not like it'd be Santorum. I mean, Romney would govern as a centrist, and I don't just have, keep it's saying like, this, like, that's exactly what we were saying in April of 2000. That's yeah. exactly what people said about, yeah. about like, George W. Bush. Why do they ran Santorum? I mean, why do they have Michelle Bachman? It's like so that the one that they wind up offering is going to look, you know, mm. like a reasonable alternative. Right. It's like, right. you know, well, he's not Rick Santorum. It's like, okay, well, you know, you you really have to like scrape the bottom of some very unpleasant, you right. know, sewer to find anybody that was Rick. <laughs> you know, I mean, they broke the mold. Uh, but uh, you know, he's and and you know. He may be, you know, the Etch-a-Sketch president. I mean, he may be the guy who was the governor of uh, Massachusetts 
as opposed to the, you know, the nightmare um, guy was running around trying to out Santorum Santorum. Uh, but who knows? And the fact is, you know, the, the party itself at this point has become so absolute. I mean, we are living in a time when 40% of the wealth is controlled by the top 1% of the population and 20% of the wealth is owned, not controlled, but owned by the top 1%. It's insane. It's absolutely, you can go back uh, to Mark Twain and, and, you know, earlier than that, I mean, uh, to Hamilton and, and Madison, uh, a plutocracy of this sort is, is absolutely antithetical to democracy. And the party of the plutocracy now is the Republican Party, and that's the only thing that these people are interested in anymore. So, and not to mention things like global warming, not to mention things like the possibility of Israel nuking uh, uh, well, Israel attacking Tehran and Tehran flattening Tel Aviv and Israel deciding to use its nuclear weapon and then Pakistan. You know, I mean, you really can see the end of the world right. coming and, and, you know, that we sit around saying, well, you know, but Obama, you know, it, it, what's he done for us lately? You know, why is he, you know, why, you know, why is Tim Geithner still secretary? It's like, yeah, but really, seriously, I mean, we're in... But, so you, but is there a valid criticism from the left of Obama? There are many, many... Val there will never be a president in office because, of course, ruling in a democracy, exercising power in a democracy, is a matter of a series of bone-bending, uh, uh, soul-tormenting compromises uh, of the most horrendous kind and swallowing stuff that no one would ever really want to swallow. There's nothing pure about it. There's nothing, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, Emerson says that politics is the motion of the soul illustrated in power, and we'd all like to believe that's true, and I think in a way it is true, but the motion of the soul is kind of corkscrew, it turns out, and anybody who's an adult should sort of know that already. And, and this idea that, that we, I mean, you know, I've had big arguments with, I mean, Oscar Eustace and among other people about, you know, uh, how does one voice a critique, a legitimate critique? I mean, what did the abolitionist left do when Lincoln seemed to be saying, and in fact publicly did say on several occasions, that if he could save the Union, which he felt he had an absolute mandate by the Constitution to do, without ending slavery, which he felt he had absolutely no legal right to do as president, and he was right about that, uh, um, he would save the Union. It didn't work out that way, and the reason it didn't work out that way has, a, I think, an immense amount to do with Abraham Lincoln. But uh, uh, the, uh, what was the abolitionists left to say when they heard things like that? And, you know, and they said lots of things, but you know, up until October of 1864, they were still looking for a third party candidate when you know, uh, the, the choice at that point was really going to be uh, having, you know, uh, a Democratic Party that was so monstrously pro-slavery and, you know, I mean, anyway. So it's a, I think it's a... So in a, in a parallel universe where, where you decide, no, not going to spend the time on Lincoln, do you think you're one of the critics on the left of Obama at this point? I mean, how much do you think that your, your perspective on things has changed because of these six years you spent? You know, I mean, I, I look sun. back, I was, to the extent that anybody paid atten any attention to what I was saying, during the Carter administration, when I was a good deal younger, but we were all so immensely um, uh, uh, hard on Carter. He did so many things that we just hated, yeah. and look what we prepared the way for. Uh, um, uh, certainly during the Clinton years, I mean, I have a lot. I still have a lot of issues with a lot of things that Clinton did, but uh, you know, the the. The fact that the President of the United States doesn't turn out to be um, everything that we would like him to be um, politically is is you know disappointing the immediate turning on these on these figures i mean what the question I think we have to ask ourselves is are we actually going to build a real i mean do you actually believe as a grown up that you are building that you are part of the building of a movement for political power for the, for actual power? that can begin to address the monstrous social ills, environmental ills, that kind of, or are you not? And, and, uh, and, and, and if you're not, then I guess my question is, what the hell are you doing? I mean, you know. So how, how so. do you, have you been down to Occupy Wall Street? 
Or were you there? In the I fall was actually was... filming. We, I got to spend a couple of minutes with Occupy Richmond. Um, <laughs> I okay. didn't, you know, I don't know about. It. I mean, Occupy Wall Street. I, I, I don't really think I necessarily want to say. I mean, I, I was moved. I was excited. I completely agree with the critique of uh, capitalism that's inherent in a lot of what Wall they were saying. Uh, there was a really interesting article recently by uh, Joseph Stiglitz about uh, pointing out that it's not just Occupy Wall Street, but that there were economic uh, elements of economic discontent in Tahir Square, you know, in, in all of the countries involved in the Arab Spring, that, uh, that, that, that in point of fact, uh, 2011 could be characterized as a year of a beginning of a, of a great upswelling of discontent over the way that the 99% has been fucked over by the... Uh, plutocracy, right. and uh, and I'm completely supportive of that, mm -hmm. but I think that you know I don't want to necessarily get into uh, you know huge detail about it, but I I feel that that we also have to take into account uh, the true nature of the country as it stands now and how power is held onto and built. I believe that a second term for Barack Obama is so exponentially better absolutely for this country and the world than a first term for Mitt Romney that I, you know, and, and that we, we have to hang on to the Senate, we have to get back that. I mean, right. I think that these things are, are of inconceivable importance now because I think, you know, you can talk about 1848, you can talk about 1871, you can talk about, you know, whatever you want to talk about. One thing that's changed is we've never had the possibility of destroying all life on the planet up until fairly recently. And, and we may already have sailed far past that, so it's time to really begin to fix these things and to find the political means of doing it. So one of the things that I've been struck by in your plays uh, and other writing is that you're, you can sit here and, and express your political convi convictions, but in your dramatic writing, things are always more nuanced, that, there's a, that you have a capacity to surprise in a way that many people, I don't think this is, a, uh, this is an extreme statement, most playwrights who, who are expressing their politics in their writing are doing so in a way that is not surprising. Uh, and one example of this that has stuck with me even years after I've seen it is a short play that you wrote about Laura Bush. I don't know if anyone has seen it. Has anyone seen? Uh, it's, it, was, it's, it, was, I've only, it was only performed in the city a couple of times, I think, and it didn't have a long run. But we didn't do a run. I sort of let anybody. It was in the. I read it right before in February before the bombing of Baghdad started, and then I published it in the Nation first, and then I said that anybody anywhere in the country who wanted to do it, if they were doing it as part of an anti-war event, could do it. Right. And uh, and it was done. I think the workshop did it like six or seven mm. times, and I've done it at various readings. And Marsha Gay Harden. Uh, Holly Hunter. I saw it here Bush. twice. I saw it in Minneapolis once. I keep wanting to see it again. But it, this is another. I think it's another facet of, the, of this question that we are charged with talking about tonight about the connect. You know, the, the 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 point, the line where imagination and, and what the world, the, the hand that the world deals us, collide. Can you talk a bit about how you ended up writing that piece about her? I went to. Um, uh, I actually spoke at. I don't like speaking at big open air demonstrations, because I, I think I, sa I start to get, I'm nervous, and my voice gets higher. I, I think I sound like B. Arthur anyway, <laughs> but um, when, I, when I really, you know, when you're up in front of a big crowd of people with a microphone, you should be, you know, like kind of Abby Hoffman, I mean, you should be like sort of, you know, doing a number, and, and I'm like really not I, butch enough to pull it off, so I, 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 don't, I don't like doing it. And this was one of the coldest Februarys ever, and it was, they still think, maybe the largest single demonstration in New York City history, maybe the one in 1980 against the bomb was bigger, but it was, it was immense. And I, uh, for some reason, they asked me to speak, and I spoke. And, and uh, I was standing on the stage looking at this enormous, you know, just fields and fields and fields of freezing people who were there, and we were all there for the same reason. We were horrified that the United States was going to, with, with this monstrous uh, guy in the White House, was, you know, uh, having stolen the White House, was going to start, uh, I mean, the, the awesome uh, 
terrifying military force of the United States was going to be turned against this country that had already been, you know, savaged by 10 years of economic sanctions that had really reduced it already to a kind of medieval satrapy. And everybody with a brain, um, except for some people, uh, <laughs> Uh, knew that uh, there were no weapons of mass destruction. This whole thing was complete, you know, a complete, you know, shadow puppet show. Uh, and we were all standing there in, in rage and horror saying, don't. And then the next day, Bush was asked about the uh, demonstration. And there were demonstrations like it all over the world. And he said, well, it's like a focus group. And there was great indignation on the left. Oh, my God, how could he say that? And I thought, oh, my God, it's the first true thing this man has ever said. Uh, that's exactly what we are. We could express an opinion. We couldn't do anything else. We, have ha we had almost no representation in the halls of power. Uh, and, and we weren't a tiny group of people. We were a, a, an immense sea of people. And we could do nothing because we had so completely lost access to real political power. All we could do was, and that night I decided, I've never, I've never really done it this way before, but I had been, uh, during the campaign, I read an interview uh, with Laura Bush, uh, and they told, mentioned that she was a high school librarian and that she liked to read a lot, and, and they, the interviewer said, what's your favorite book? And she said, The Brothers Karamazov, and he said, what's your favorite section? And she said, The Grand Inquisitor. And, it's like, oh, wow, we have something in common. I mean, it's not my favorite, <laughs> but I love Dostoevsky, who is, you know, a figure of incredible uh, ideological indeterminacy. And Sontag pointed out that it's this great irony that, that many of Dostoevsky's uh, deepest admirers and best critics are Jews because the guy was a hideous anti-Semite. But, uh, you know, anyway, um, I mean, it's probably also true of Wagner. You know, I mean, there, we... Uh, what, you, we can talk about that another time. Yeah, but, uh, you yeah. know, it's... Um, <laughs> Wagner is probably a mistake. Uh, I've gone off of him. But, uh, but Dostoevsky is really immensely great. And, you know, so I, I became interested at, at that point in why this woman... I mean, I then became... After I wrote the play, I discovered that, you know, Condoleezza Rice, who was an uh, Eastern European Soviet uh, historian at, at Stanford... Um, uh, when the first Bush picked her out of obscurity to defend his policies in the first Iraq war, uh, that her favorite author is Dostoevsky. And when she sent, when Bush was, went over to meet Putin, or Pooty Poot, as he liked to call him, that really was his nickname uh, for Putin, uh, Condoleezza Rice gave him Crime and Punishment to read. And then the really awesome thing was when they found Saddam Hussein hiding in that little sort of uh, Spider foxhole that he, they had dug for him. Uh, he had one book with him, and it was Crime and Punishment, uh, translated. So something's going on here. And, um, <laughs> and I began to, you know, well, uh, it's like uh, there's this great line, uh, Bertrand Russell, when he went over for the first time to see the show trials in Moscow, and he wrote to his uh, mistress, Adeline Morel, uh, I think it was a letter to Adeline Morel. He said, well, I've, I've now I've seen Stalinism up close, and it's absolutely as horrendous and repellent as everyone says it is. He said, on the other hand, think of a country populated entirely by the characters of a Dostoevsky novel, and then try and think of a form of government that could rule them. <laughs> and you'd probably come. I, I apologize to Russian people. But that's really an awful thing to say, but you kind of, you kind of. Uh, can I tell you my favorite joke? Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. There's a, oh, I won't, I shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I have to, please. Uh, you probably all heard it. I actually think I got this joke from George Will, not in personal conversation, but I uh, there's a Frenchman, an Italian, and an Irishman, and they're, uh, they're all died and they've gone to heaven. And uh, uh, St. Peter says, you're all good people when you're on earth. Do you know this joke? No. And uh, you can have anything you want. And the Frenchman says, okay, I want my people, the French people, to become the greatest painters the world has ever known. And uh, St. Peter says, granted. And the Italian says, well, I want my people, the Italian people, to become the greatest writers of opera the world has ever known. And St. Peter says, granted. And the Russian says, I want my neighbor Ivan's mule to die. <laughs> <laughs> if there are any Russian people in the audience or watching this later, that was Tony's sentiment. I have nothing but fondness for the Russian people.
I've told that joke to a number of Russians, and they really seem to like it a lot. <laughs> we were talking about Laura Bush. And her fondness for Russian. So well, yeah, so that's that's where so that's where it uh, sort of came from. And you know, I mean, she was a Democrat when she was a girl. Her parents were Democrats. She had some things happen to her when she was young uh, that that caused, I think, a tremendous amount of internalized guilt. And in, I actually have changed my opinion about her because I read that book, uh, uh, Dead uh, Right, about Bush's uh, those interviews that he gave to a Texas journalist. And one of the things that he says in the book is. That uh, the guy says, well, you know, you've kind of, he doesn't say it this way, but he basically says, you've kind of screwed up everything. How do you get out of bed in the morning? And Bush said, well, Laura's the one who makes me get out of bed every morning. And I thought, well, you know, thanks a lot. So <laughs> I feel you, read, like you read probably, that after you wrote the play? Oh, yeah, long okay. after. Uh, the, the, I, yeah, it's sympathetic in a way. I mean, the, well, the play. Well, or the thing the, that I like about the play is that it starts out, everybody laughs at the beginning because right. you think it's going to be, it's, it's Laura Bush coming uh, uh, to heaven. Uh, basically to read uh, the Grand Inquisitor in a sort of after-school reading program to three dead Iraqi school kids. And uh, you st it starts out and everybody thinks that it's, you know, just going to be making a lot of fun of her. Right. But then I think by the end you feel something very different. Because, of course, most of the kids, one thing that right-wing commentators who have written about the play in great indignation never notice is that all the kids have actually died. This is before the war begins. And so they've all died under sanctions. And the sanctions were... Uh, initially, uh, uh, well, the first Bush, but then Clinton's. And uh, um, uh, so they're, you know, the, the deaths of these kids are not entirely uh, Bush administration responsibilities. I mean, they're all of ours. And, and there's, a, there's a way in which there's an implication. And I think that the feeling of powerlessness uh, was something that I was feeding off of when I, when I wrote the play. Well, that, that note that comes out, because se every time I've seen it, it it's, it's played exactly the same way, where for five minutes they think it's going to be satire or some kind of character demolition. And then by the end, you feel terrible, because what you've done is you, you, you bring out this moral conscience, this aching sense of responsibility and discomfort, and you do it in a way that makes everybody feel implicated somehow, that we should all be having that kind of, feeling that kind of grief and that kind of, um, uh, that kind of um, um, involvement in all the terrible things that were happening to children in Iraq. I'm curious about that, that when you feel a character, did you see that coming? Did you expect the play to end up there? Or did that unfold as after you sat down and said, you know, Dostoevsky, Laura Bush, there's something here? That, 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 and once I had the idea that they were, that she was doing this after school reading program to three dead Iraqi school kids. The other thing that, that really helped was I was listening at the time to Olivier Messiaen's opera, uh, Saint Francois d'Assise, which they're gonna do at the Met next year, and which is just an absolutely magnificent, I'm, I've always been very interested in St. Francis. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a, just one of the great works of musical theater, one of the great pieces of music. And Messiaen was very interested in, in natural sounds and uh, sometimes actually included in recordings of them, but also approximated them in, uh, musically and, and especially birds. And uh, there, there are these interludes of, of Messiaen bird sounds and they're, they're so uh, beautiful. And there's a, his Catholicism is the Catholicism that I remember from when I was a medieval studies major. That it's like, mm -hmm. it's not nice. I mean, it's, you know, sort of Flannery O'Connor kind of, you know, like uh, grim, Syria, you know, all, all those uh, people. Uh, it's tough, and, and there's a lot of uh, awe, um, it, you know, is, is, is compounded of both um, magnificence and appreciation of magnificence and real terror, and, uh, and, and you feel that in these, in these sections. And, I, and there was something about the fact that, that these... Uh, about that sound, so when in the play she asks the kids things and they and they respond as opposed to the angel who's sitting with her um, is uh, uh, speaking for them for the most part, but when they do speak they they speak you just hear the the bird songs mm -hmm. and it's another language that we don't have access to, and that helped me a lot in in doing it and I didn't know when I started i but you know again the if you read Dostoevsky, any Dostoevsky, you just get plunged into this, you know, um, miasma of 
you know, you, you really lose all track of, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's left. It's, it's so overwhelmingly powerful and so upsetting and so profoundly um, sort of malevolent and, and good at the same time. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, it's, it's a terrifying, he's a terrifying writer. I mean, I, I don't know whether he's any, whether he's better than Tolstoy or not, but it certainly doesn't feel it's just, it's just an over, overwhelming experience. Like, I mean, Brecht hated his guts. He thought he was just an awful writer because of this exact thing. I find that really immensely powerful. And, uh, and, and I think that, that the combination of all those things kind of uh, led to it. So. Um, but that, that uh, capacity for surprise is one of the things that has always struck me about the plays. I wanted to ask you, we could go back to The Glass Menagerie. Um, you make a point about the politics of the play. Uh, you say in the introduction that, that I think a lot of people might not see the political implications of it, but you think that they're there. And it's about what you've said about power, about, about the way that he was writing about people who are weak. Um, but in this play, it's not, clear, it, it's not clear whose fault the weakness is exactly, right? Um, that, that's the complicated and challenging thing about this play. Um, do you want to explain that a little? Oh, God. Well, that's sort of the whole introduction. I mean, the, you know, I was, the first thing that I, when I said yes to writing the introduction, I opened it and was really shocked that, that it has this epigraph that I had completely forgotten. E.E. Uh, e. Cummings, who was a poet that I really have very little use for, uh, and it's, it's no one, not even the rain, has such small hands. And I had never, I mean, I must have read The Glass Menagerie a hundred times, and I've seen it a billion times, and it, it's full of little surprises. That's one surprise. The other surprise is that right there on the copyright page, it says um, uh, that his mother co-owns the copyright. He gave her half the proceeds from Glass Menagerie and took care, that took care of her financially for the rest of her life. Uh, and uh, it was also a surprise to me that there are all these uh, elements in Glass Menagerie um, uh, that are, that feel like European political theater of, of Brecht and Piscator. And it turns out that when he was working on Glass Menagerie, he was actually here at the New School uh, in Piscator's uh, theater experimental workshop. So, you know, but there's a, there's a political dimension. And of course, it is a play about, it's, a, it's set in World War II. It's written during World War II. It was written in 1944. It was finished in 44 and opened while the war was still on and came in Chicago and then came to New York just as the war was coming to an end, but the war was still, the world was still at war. And, uh, and, it's a, and you know, Tom's monologues have, ha, have a political uh, s content. Mm -hmm. They handle it in an odd way. So a lot of what I was dealing with in the, in the, in the introduction is, is to investigate wh why did he use that E.E. E. Cummings poem and I read the rest of the poem and uh, uh, that the line is from, you know, what, and, and thinking about William's particular relationship to power and his sense of himself as being the voice of the, uh, of the powerless and the incredibly deep um, uh, uh, commitment that he made to always speak for the fugitive kind and, uh, and not as their savior, not as the person who, who had, you know, sort of, you know, big and brawly and who come and do battle for them, but rather as one of them, as a, as a neurasthenic, you know, godforsaken mess. And uh, uh, I wrote in the thing about the fact that when he was in Provincetown in 44, finishing uh, Glass Menagerie, Robert Duncan was in Provincetown at the same time, uh, giving readings, uh, well, he actually finishing the essay and then giving readings a few months later, which Tennessee attended, of uh, his essay, The Homosexual in Society, which was published in the Partisan Review, and which is the, kind of the beginning of modern American gay consciousness in a way it's like for, you know, and where Duncan identifies himself as gay, but the, the essay seems to skip several steps of what we would think of as gay liberation, and it, it's really kind of an attack on gay people. I mean, it's a really harsh and shocking essay, and it's so shocking that Duncan himself spent the rest of his life kind of trying to explain it. He never repudiated it, but, and, and that Tennessee heard that. There's just a lot of very complicated relationship to power. I mean, I think that, you know, if you're writing a play as opposed to an essay, um, 
and this is where I really, uh, and I feel more and more I drift away from my idol in terms of playwriting, Bertolt Brecht, uh, who set up Aristotle as the great you know, straw demon of the theater he was trying to do. But there is something about catharsis, there's something about terror and pity, or as our mutual friend Oscar is fond of saying, you know, the Athenians in whatever century it was, BC, invented, was it third century? Invented two, fifth, fifth, fifth yeah. century, invented two things simultaneously, sort of theater and democracy. Right. And as Oscar is fond of saying, uh, the, the thing that perhaps connects these two things is compassion, right. is, is empathy, is the gift of empathy. And, uh, and, and the building of community in, a th in, in the theatrical event is something that I've always been and have become only more and more. Now that I'm working in film, it's the thing that I miss most about mm. theater. I mean, it also is the thing that makes you, you know, become a crazy old person long before your time if you spend your life working in theater because right. it's so enormously enervating and difficult. Mm. Uh, theater to watch is not, or to put on? To watch, to put on. Theater is just really hard to go to. It's really hard to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it takes a lot out of you. And, and you know, you just, uh, we went to see The Caretaker last night and, you know, it's not, you know, you go to see a movie and you're free. If the movie's, The Caretaker's good. But if you go to see a movie and it's, and it's terrible, you can just hate it with complete abandon. You can get up and walk <laughs> out. It won't bother the people on the screen at, you know, at all. They're not there anymore. Right. It's, you know, you, there's nothing as uncomfortable as right. being in a room with live people on stage. Even if you're loving what they do, what, what if they screw up? Yeah. One of the guys in, in The Caretaker last night was just the young guy was just, you know, doing that sort of British thing and you're kind of rattling through these long swaths of pinter stuff and, and, uh, and doing just, just so dexterously and just, it was frightening how good he was and then he, I can't remember what word it was, but he hit one word like uh, solicitude or something and, and he stumbled and then had to say the word over again. You just feel the whole audience go, Arr! for a second. <laughs> and it was one word in the entire play. That was the only one. And I'm sure everybody left thinking, well, he did screw up that one. You know? <laughs> And, and, you know, God help you if something really, fraught, like an actor right. comes on stage and forgets his line and, yeah. and goes blank, and then you've lost it. That kind of stuff yeah. is, so, is so interesting. But the... The parting company from Brecht, you were saying. The difference yeah, between playing and the, an essay. You know, the, the evoking of compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the whole point of doing... Which Brecht didn't why, want to do. Why, if you really want to say something about the war in Iraq, not just write an essay, why make a character named Laura Bush and a character named Angel? The kids aren't on stage, just empty little chairs. But right. you know, you have these people, and you've made up their names or whatever, and you make other grown-up people put on wigs and hmm. hats and come out and pretend to be these people that they're not, and all that stuff. I mean, it's not—it's not a mature, respectable thing for. You know, <laughs> you know, I've always uh, said that you know the worst moment of being a playwright is that is that moment when you realize you have to start naming these characters, and you. Well, you're going to be called Fred, and, <laughs> and you suddenly remember what it was like to be eight years old and sitting yeah. in the backyard with you know a, a pine comb and a coffee can and an empty milk carton and going, "Hi, George." Well, you know, it's like, <laughs> it feels it feels like that, and right. and then you give them names, and if you've done your homework, they start to become these bullying, frightening people who won't do anything that you've asked uh, them to do right. and are screwing up your perfect plan for a nice little <laughs> easy play that's going to make you lots of money. Um, <laughs> uh, um. uh, and, but why do that? And the reason that you do it is because uh, it must be. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, um, but one of them must be that there's something in the human that we have to have access to in order to understand ideas, that there's a way in which these ideas that, and the dialectic that you're putting into bodies on stage must have uh, a necessary correlate in the human. And if the human on stage isn't human, if you haven't done your work, if that person doesn't have this ability to surprise themselves or other people, if they're not full of contradiction, if they're there to sort of dutifully represent your point of view in one clean way, in the way that no human being ever does, then you're cheating the theater of the power that it has to, to do something that only it can do, that, that an essay can't do, that a beautifully argued essay can't do. There are things that a beautifully argued essay can do 
that the theater can't do. And there's political activism which does something that no art can do. In other words, give you agency and make you actually take part in changing things. So that's a whole other action. But, but the, the weird business of, of writing Amanda Wingfield or writing Laura, um, writing Blanche Dubois, I mean, he tries to make her represent Western civilization, but of course, he also makes her into a whole lot, I mean, you know, she's, she's a whole boatload of contradictions. And so, you know, you listen to her and you, you, you feel, yes, she's right. There are, we have climbed up out of the slime and Stanley's a beast and she's a, you know, a virtuous lady, but then you also, because of the immense genius of that play, know that she's full of shit <laughs> and, and, and not at the same time. Or if you see this spectacular production of Death of a Salesman and you, you, know, you watch you know, Willie and Biff at the end and, and you know, when you see a really great production of that very, very, very great play, yeah. both of them are right and both of them are wrong. Yeah. And, and, and the, the agony of that, uh, the impossibility of that, um, uh, and, and you know what, what Nietzsche says, what it does is it, it, it demolishes you so that something new can come along. That demolishing, I think, only can happen in art. And, and if you're going to make art, make art. Don't, don't make you know, an essay right. that's kind of hiding behind actors. I've been, I'm, I've been writing this book when I'm not at the public theater uh, about uh, the intellectuals, American intellectuals in, in the World War I years. And as part of that, I was spending a lot of time with William James, who was very important to them. And a lot of these questions are in James. Everyone should go home and read William James and Tony's essay. Uh, and, and there are two things in there that have struck me. Uh, one is that, uh, uh, I'm going to try not to screw this up, but that our, uh, our, our thoughts do not just sort of occur in some platonic space in our heads. They are the result of our feelings and desires. Uh, the feelings come first. And what that says to me as someone who works in the theater is that's great news because theater traffics in the feelings. There's a re the reason why the theater can do things that an essay can't do is because it's working on, it's hitting you in a different way. It's, it's, it's asking you to respond uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an emotional way. And that there's a way in which it's not even, it's a, it's a direct way to change the world in a sense. It's just changing the world more slowly. It's not, you know, it's not an essay which changes people's minds and then they agree, yes, yes, this is right, I, I've now rethought everything. It's that it's not the tidal wave, it's, it's, it's the wave action over a long time. It makes you, uh, you know, every time I, the Laura Bush, you know, Laura Bush, like that, then I was moved and because I was moved, I was changed. But, you know, it's not just that it works on feelings though, because it, it also works on ideas uh -huh. and, and, and it works, I mean, it does a number of different things. I mean, uh, when you have a character on stage yelling in defense of labor unions, you suddenly discover that there are people in the audience who, like you, hopefully, actually have secretly liked labor unions all this time when we're all supposed to be, you know, you know too, too smart to, when we understand that they actually cause all the evil in the world. I mean, that, that, that even though it's not fashionable anymore to do it, that, that you're, you're there and you're seeing somebody talk about labor unions and that's kind of exciting to you. And that's part of the experience too. Yeah. But, it's, but it's happening in, in, this, in this enormously complicated way. So yeah. it's sort of the, it's the engine of both idea and, and feeling, which right. is also what's happening inside the character because we, our ideas, our ideologies, I mean, ideology is a vaguer thing, but, but our principles are the things that we say to ourselves right that we believe are true are immensely important in terms of, and the ways that we succeed in meeting those ideals and fail in meeting those ideals make us into, uh, that's what makes history. Right. And, and uh, so I think that you know, when, you, when you see that, that amalgam of stuff on right. stage. The other thing I would say in response is that the power, I mean, I, I, again, Brecht would just vomit all over me if you heard me say this, but. <laughs> um, the thing that I don't understand is, is because I spent a lot of time working on Mother Courage and her children, sure. and less time, but still a lot of time recently working on Good Person of Sichuan, my two favorite Brecht plays. Oh. Uh, and, and I've spent time in the past working on his Lehrstück, his learning plays, which everybody thinks is, is the most, those are the experimental plays he wrote before he left Germany, before he had to go into exile from Hitler. And everybody thinks of these plays as being, you know, works of, you know, the measures taken and the exception and the rule and the Baden Baden play for learning, that these are like, these kind of dogmatic little pieces of you know, Stalinist propaganda. Of course, Brecht wasn't a Stalinist, but uh, 
the, the plays are all about death and dying, and they're enormously upsetting. I mean, the Baden Baden play for learning, the, the clown show, Mr. Smith, where this giant clown is like ripped to pieces by two friends, literally made people throw up when it was first done at Hindemith's new musical festival in like 1929 or something. I mean, it, it's a, and, and when you do it on stage, it's really upsetting. Um, and it has a very neat little political point, but the political point is only part of it. The, you know, so when you watch Mother Courage, I mean, good luck if you think you can find, I mean, if people say, well, it's just an obvious point. You know, if you want the war to work for you, you have to give the war its due. If you think that's what that play is about, you know, then please explain why anyone with a heart at the end of Mother Courage is, is you know, sobbing. It's, yeah. the, it's, the most, it's the saddest play of the 20th century. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that, the, I keep coming back to this, the power of theater, the power of art, it seems to me, is what Shakespeare says, because, of course, Shakespeare's right about everything. Uh, <laughs> it's the power, your relationship, the, the, the relationship of the stage to the audience is the relationship of the dream and uh, the product of the unconscious midsummer. Is this to the midsummer, midsummer act to the sleeper. And the reason it works is because our deal with you is you don't have to do anything with what we're going to tell you. Uh, we don't even really know what we're telling you. Um, uh, we know some of what we're telling you. And you're not going to ever be sure how much we know. Um, but, you know, and, and if you have an unconscious, and most of us do, um, except some people, uh, uh, you know, your unconscious is, plays little games with you all the time. It, it, it would much rather, even when you're asleep, and it could just sort of knock on your door and say, by the way, you want to, you know, fuck your mother and kill your father. <laughs> it, it will give you really, uh, you really like that. Um, uh, we can talk afterwards. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, it rarely does that. It'll give you little riddles, to, silly little riddles. It's very good at it, usually. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and you're asleep. You're, you're, you're supine. When you wake up, you have many choices. You can not remember it at all and say, I don't ever remember my dreams. You can say, I remember my dream and do the worst thing you can possibly do to anybody and go up and say, I had this weird dream last night, mm -hmm. which is horrible. <laughs> like, okay, what is it? Because they want to run away from you because what's more boring than hearing somebody else's dream? Um, but, or you can, you can not remember it until the middle of the next day and suddenly it, right. it breaks in like an acid flashback. Uh, I mean, and, and you can choose to interpret it and think about it and obsess about it and go into therapy and have somebody help you figure out what it means. Or just shrug your shoulders. And, I mean, you have all these options. Uh, and I believe that, anyway. Yeah. So, but I was frustrated, the idea that I couldn't get up and yell and scream about this. Was, you know, I wrote this play in 1984, and Reagan was, you know, and he helped me out by going and decorating the SS graves at Bitburg right when we had the production opening. So it was the New York Post said, uh, Prez takes rap for Nazi storm, and I had one of the characters on stage reading the Post. Um, and, but, you know, you, you learn that as gratifying as it would be to have that power, if you're an artist, Maybe, I don't know, there's no definite anything in art, but it seems to me more and more that you have to sort of say, my power as an artist on the world is an indirect power. I have other kinds of direct power. I can vote. I can raise money for good people, good candidates. I can occupy Wall Street. I can, you know, be a directly involved citizen activist. Mm. But that's my other job, my day job, being a playwright, what, you know, it's like being a teacher. I mean, on some level, you, of course, have profound impact on kids' minds, but you have to honor, to some degree, the fact that you're not there as a polemicist, you're not there as a propagandist, you're there to help kids learn how to think and find the truth. And, you know, the, the thing that you have to believe is, if you're right about all this stuff, if, if your progressive politics are true, you don't have to figure out a way to sell them. They'll sell themselves because if you're true about life, life will sell them for you. You know, the, uh, uh, any, any true representation of humanity is going to show that uh, uh, justice is, is a desirable thing, that injustice is a bad thing, that inequality is, uh, 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 you know, uh, a problematic thing. Uh, and that profound economic inequality, I mean, you know, these things will emerge because they're true, not because you 
had to kind of sell them. So. so, we have a little time left for some questions. Um, there's a way to have a little more light in the room, perhaps. Uh, there are some people in the aisles with microphones. It would just ask that you raise your hand and someone will find you with the mic so that we can all hear what is on your mind. You can also, if you'd like to ask Paul Oster questions about his work, I'm, I'm officially designated to make up stuff. And, uh, Does anyone have I'm a question? Kidding. Or not, maybe not. Uh, down here? Hi, Jean. I'm wondering about uh, Havel. How would you place him as? He was quite a great play playwright, and he was certainly very political. Yeah, I mean, I. Um, Everyone hear that? Uh, the question about uh, Tony's thoughts on Václav Havel. You know, uh, I. I mean, it's an interesting question because we had. I had a big. I had to do this weird thing for Penn on everything I've done this week for Penn has been weird, um, uh, and I had to do this thing in, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, where. where um, me and uh, two other writers had to sit on stage while the Kronos Quartet sat next to us and played music while we talked. And uh, it's like really maybe the weirdest thing I've ever done on stage. <laughs> I love the Kronos Quartet, but it's like my parents are both musicians. And uh, um, Marjan Satrapi, uh, who wrote uh, Persepolis, and um, Rula, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her last name. She's a, a, a journalist. Uh, sorry? Rula Jabril. And we had a big argument when we were putting this thing together about, these, about questions of, uh, of the direct or indirect power of art. Um, my feeling is a little bit that when you're making art, I mean, I consider myself enormously fortunate to have worked as an artist and lived as, as a person in a, in a functioning uh, democracy, which the United States still, I believe, very much is. Um, it won't always be that if we don't take care of it, but mm. it still is. And, uh, and that means that there's a possibility of making even radical alterations in, in the political destiny of this country and, and uh, I think real radical progress through um, electoral means. And I have lived in my lifetime through probably the greatest moment of that, the African American Civil Rights Movement and, and uh, uh, the you know, it's, it's governmental um, uh, apotheosis, in a sense, uh, in, the, in the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and the Great Society programs in the, in the 60s. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, when speech is protected, as it mostly is in the United States, um, and that's not to say that there aren't problems and violations of that, but for the most part, it is. Uh, um, protected, uh, art, making art, even art that offends, you know, there'll always be contretemps, but basically uh, the laws of the land still, if we can keep the Supreme Court from going completely over to the dark side, um, uh, will, you know, um, uh, work to protect you. Uh, when you're making art in a country like Havel was for most of the time when uh, Czechoslovakia was, you know, part of the uh, uh, Soviet bloc, um, and 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 expression is is enormously dangerous. Um, I mean, that's Penn's great mission is to try and you know protect writers, journalists who work in places where they go to prison uh, or are killed. Um, uh, for trying to say the, tell the truth through their work. And uh, uh, I think that it's a, it's a complicating factor in terms of the art that's produced. I think art produced in extreme circumstances um, has, uh, it's, it's difficult to ascertain. I, this is all a long-winded way of saying, I don't really know what I think right now of, as much as I Im admire, and I admire him immensely, uh, Havel as a, as a statesman and as a hero of the Czech people I, uh, and as a human uh, hero of the human race. Um, his plays are, uh, I don't really, I don't know that I've read any great translations of them. I'm not sure about the translations that I've read, 
but I think there's a, there, there, um, one feels, I feel, watching them, that they were probably experienced radically differently in Prague in the 60s and 70s than they would be experienced in, you know, a nice theater in Brooklyn in 2012. And, and you know, you can do uh, Neil Simon in, in the right circumstances and it can be very, very dangerous. And I, I'm not saying that he's, I mean, I like Neil Simon a lot, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's, I, I think it's, um, I think it's tricky. I think it's hard. Uh, you know, we look at the art that came out of the concentration camps, and it's unbelievably moving that people in those circumstances could produce art. Um, but some of the art is, you know, uh, 60, 70 years, you look at it, and it's not a great, op a great opera that Victor Ullmann wrote in Terrazin, but it, it's for, uh, an opera written in Terrazin. It's an immense... So, you know, and, and in Terrazin at that, that time, the effect of it must be infinitely greater than going to see, you know, the marriage of Figaro uh, at the Met because your 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 you know your life depends on it. The people who who are on stage are at great risk. I mean, you know, it, it it elevates the stakes in a way that I would have to say I feel is somewhat um, external to the work of art. And then the question is, when all when the stakes are different, you know, I mean, Ibsen wrote uh, uh, a Doll's House when there was a kind of oppression that women faced in uh, Scandinavian countries and all over the world that made the play dynamite. It made somebody like Emma Goldman want a stage manager touring. She did. She actually was a stage manager for a touring company of, uh, can you imagine having Emma Goldman, <laughs> the queen of anarchism as your stage, it, you know. <laughs> that must have been interesting. Uh, like all the cues would be happening. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the, these plays, Ibsen was so dangerous at that point. Now, Ibsen is not dangerous anymore, but Ibsen is still very, very great. And, the, you know, when Ibsen wrote Doll's House and Hedda Gabler, he wasn't risking, uh, uh, he was pushing the envelope, but he wasn't risking, you know, life and limb to do it. And he was able to work within a tradition and, and deepen uh, the art in a way that it had never been done before. He changed acting, he changed theater practice, he changed everything. When you, when you do A Doll's House now, I mean, even though there's still, you know, hideous oppression against women all over the world, you can still do A Doll's House in a country like the United States where the sort of uh, uh, oppression that Nora is facing is, is not recognizable necessarily, or at least not uh, from the direct experience of a lot of the women in the audience, and yet the play has immense power, and it still has immense power for everyone. The reason is because people are, there's always a question of injustice and oppression in us. And when a play traces the, the human dimension of oppression as brilliantly as Ibsen does in The Doll's House, it's always going to have some use in some way. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, possibly writing under extremely uh, exigent, uh, terrible circumstances uh, may make it, you know, I mean, and then of course sometimes there are things that completely you know, Shostakovich wrote those symphonies, you know, during the sea. I mean, there are, there, are, uh, but the, there are people that, you know, write under impossible circumstances and produce uh, great masterpieces. And again, it's like, you know, that's nice for them, but they came to us from the moon and they don't really tell us what <laughs> most human beings are like. So I, I think that I feel terrible now that I've said, you've, yeah, no. Gene, you've made me say something bad about Vaclav Havel and I don't, I don't want to... <laughs> Do that, uh, you know. But he's, uh, you did but just call him a hero of the human race. Of the human race, too. And, he, so. and he was. He was a really. I feel very sad that I never got to. I really wanted to meet him, and I never got to meet him. I got to meet him once in the public lobby, and it's the only time in my life I have had no words. To, I just awesome, shook right? his hand and had nothing to say because I was overwhelmed by it. Uh, I think there's another question. If we could back there, possibly. And we are almost out of time, so just ask if you could just jump yes. right into the question. All right. How do you know when you've done enough research? I'm sorry. One more time. How do you know when you've finished researching and you can start writing, uh, or do you sort of do it both simultaneously? The, um, Good question. Thank when, you. When the theater uh, that has uh, scheduled the play calls and threatens to have you <laughs> killed if you don't get them a draft, I, that's a really good question. You must be a writer. I, I use research uh, both to research and also it's a really good way of maintaining your dignity while avoiding work. Um, <laughs> 
And, uh, you know, at some point you're going to feel, you know, I think you'll actually, I mean, the deadline will probably help. Uh, if you've run out of money and you have to pay the rent, that will help. Um, and, and also, you get to a point, I think, you have to develop within yourself a point where you just have your notebook with the research, with all the amazing things, is too f big and you can't even remember what's in there. You should probably throw the thing in a drawer or burn it or something because if you're, if you're too burdened by it, I think, if you're creating fiction, uh, you're going to wind up you know, it's going to, as they say, smell of the library. I mean, it's, which is not the worst thing. They're, I like the way libraries smell, but, you know, it's, <laughs> you want to you wanna keep it, you, you know, Brecht says, you know, that every playwright has a dilettante's knowledge of his subject, and, that, and you know what he means. It's like none of us really know what we're talking about. We have to, Brecht says, you know, we create not uh, real mean, well, he, he says when you're really screwing up, you create this thing that he calls meaning effects. Uh, it, it sounds like it means something, and it really doesn't. Um, uh, but, you know, you have enough so that you can make a character sound like he or she knows everything there is to know about, you know, uh, string theory. Um, and you, of course, know nothing whatsoever about string theory. <laughs> and the five things that you've learned to put in your character's mouth that you got from reading some, you know, Tuesday section of the New York Times, you'll forget <laughs> six and a half minutes after the play is up because you'll be on to the next dilettante experience. You know, um, and unless you spend six years writing a screenplay, then you get a little bit more than a but, you know, Mostly you don't, and, and I think that the reason that we don't is not just because we're lazy and, and phony baloney, we are that, but also uh, if you become too caught up in it, you, you begin to lose uh, the metaphoricity of, of specific information. Um, you're not, again, you're not there to write a documentary about Afghanistan. You're there to write a play about Afghanistan. Uh, if your audience knows a lot about it or doesn't know a lot about it, you can't take on too much because suddenly your job is going to be to deliver all this information about Afghanistan in a play. And it was like a silly thing to do because you're watching people in makeup tell you these things. And how do you, why are you believing anything they say? You shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that, you know, it's that great thing that John Stewart said about, you know, when people say, I, I get all my news from watching your show, that it terrifies him because, you know, oh my God, it's a comedy show. And I mean, he's, you know, he's amazing. But, the, the only hope for art to survive is the skepticism of the, we have to, part of what we have to count on is the, is, is the skepticism of the audience that you know you're coming in uh, to see a lot of sort of emotionally damaged, untrustworthy people tell you things and, <laughs> and you know, you'll take it under advisement, but then you'll go home and, you know, go to Wikipedia where yeah, right. you can really learn the truth. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh. We've time for maybe one or two more. Go ahead. Um, you talk a lot about the sort of direct and indirect power of art, and specifically in theater, about transmission of feelings and ideas. Uh, and as, as someone who's worked in film as well, I'm curious to know whether you think film has the same power as theater does, or is it different? And if so, how is it different? Everyone got that? Does film have the same power in terms of just uh, uh, affecting our, our ideas and our feelings as the theater does? Thank you. Oh, you know, I mean, absolutely. I mean, when you see a great film, uh, we were talking about the third man backstage, or if you saw the film last year, A Separation from Iran, which is, did you all see it? You, uh, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, just, you know, like, nothing is better than that. That's just, that's it. But, uh, and the power is immense. Um, and in some ways it may be greater in a certain sense than theater. I mean, it's, you know, it's so, you're so much there. The thing that I always say, and I think it's true, I mean, there are huge differences between being a playwright and a screenwriter, but that's not what you're asking. The, the thing that I think is the biggest difference for me is, is it has to do with, a, with, a, with an inescapable failure on the part of theater, uh, which is that theater can do many things, but it can never create a completely convincing illusion. Uh, the illusion that it creates is always going to be, for anybody who's got their eyes open, kind, you know, it's fake. It's at its best, at its most intense moments, you forget for a second that it's fake. And then you go back to remembering it, and you have that doubleness. And it's, that's what Shakespeare is all about. That's really what Brecht is all about. And as I've said many, many times, that's what Marx is all, that's what, you know, certainly his chapter uh, about commodity fetishism is all about. It's, the, it's, it's the, the apparentness of something versus the reality of something 
and how confusing those two things can be. And, uh, and, and so I think that what theater can do, it can, I don't think it's in any way better than breaking your heart than a great film is and may in fact be less successful at it, I don't know. Uh, certainly it's less reliable. I mean, anytime I want to just like completely lose it, I can put on terms of endearment. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's not. It's just, it's a good thing to have, you know, that when you need to really like let go. My life is a dog, terms of endearment, every, every time. Uh, I can't be sure that when I go back to see Death of a Salesman next week, that it's going to be as devastating as it was the first time I saw it, not just because I'm seeing it for the second time, but it's going to be a completely different experience. Every night, anybody who works in the theater, anybody who goes regularly to the theater and sees something more than once knows it really does change night to night, and it can be cold and chilly one night and shattering the next night, and all sorts of things can happen. Everybody knows that, except, well, mm -hmm. some people. Um, and uh, uh, I think that that's, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't have the reliability of a commodity form, which a film finally is, but it is an engine for, it's, it's I think the greatest device we've ever invented for teaching critical consciousness. It will make us learn to look at the world with double vision uh, and see that something is, you know, act one scene, act five scene one of Midsummer Night's Dream. I won't quote it, but... Quote it. Uh, it's worth you quoting. Know, when, when they find the... Lunatic uh, Lover and the Poet of Imagination all compact. Do you want... You do no, 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 that's all I got. That's all I got. He's a lot... Well, well, you know, they find the lovers in the woods, Theseus and Apollo did do, and they get up and they say, you know, all this wild stuff happened to us in the woods, and they go uh, in a daze off to Athens, back to Athens, and, uh, and, and they're uh, going to all get married. And, and uh, Hippolyta turns to Theseus uh, and says, you know, uh, to strange my Theseus that these lovers speak of, and Theseus says, more strange than true, I never may believe these antic fables, or the, these fairy tales, uh, toys, uh, the lunatic and the lover and the poet, or, I'm not going to do his whole thing, it's really long, and I never remember the, whole, the order of it. But anyway, he says basically, you know, uh, but in the night imagining some fear, how easily is a bush supposed to bear? In other words, it's, not, it's more strange than true. He keeps the dichotomy clear. There's the strange, weird stuff, and the true stuff, and they're clear. And then her great answer, which my professor at Columbia, Edward Taylor, used to tell us, it's sort of, in a way, Shakespeare's aesthetic manifesto. Uh, but all the story of the night, this is what Hippolyta says in response, all the story of the night told over, which is the play, and all their minds transfigured so together, the audience and the actors, more witnesseth than fancies images, uh, is seeing something more than fantasy, more witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy, something real, but howsoever strange and admirable. So it's, it's unreal and real at the same time. And, and you have that experience at the best moments of theater that you, some part of you is saying, this is not, this guy is not dead. You know, the example I often use is, you, there's no worse way to do a death on stage than a sword fight because it's really hard physical work to do a sword fight. And you have to be really tense because you don't want to really kill the other at. Well, sometimes you do, but <laughs> equity has very strong rules about that. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of Hamlet, of all those bodies on the stage, two of those bodies are, have just been fighting with swords. And they're, you know, you, you know and, and people talk. They go on. And if you keep Fortinbras in the play, which you always should, but people keep cutting him out, but you should always keep him in, you have to deal with him coming in and... It goes on and on, and the whole time you're sitting there watching Hamlet, you know, do this because he's been, you know, doing this for a while. And, and still, when Horatio says, you know, uh, good night, sweet flights of angels, sing thee to thy rest, if it's been a good production of Hamlet, you will lose it. And why? You know, you, 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 you lose it when Ro Juliet's father says, you know, death hangs on her like an untimely frost, and you know that she's not even dead in the play. She's just taking it. <laughs> doesn't matter. It doesn't, and, and he knew what he was doing. He does that kind of doubling of doubling of doubling all the time. And, and when you get that, there's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, and you're getting it in a communal setting when you know that everybody, and you can hear everybody losing it at the same time, everybody there at the same, at the same moment when if it's a great production of Othello and he climbs up on that bed and starts strangling Desdemona, you, the whole audience just, yeah, it's such a horrible, horrible thing. And you know everybody's there and everybody knows that it's not real and everybody knows that it's in some way very real. 
and uh, you get strange constancy. And you get a, you get a strange constancy, right? And so that's I don't think you know I loved Avatar. I thought Avatar was I mean I think he's an amazing filmmaker, and I and I went and I thought oh my God, this, you know here we go. Uh, we'll soon you know go into rooms and they'll be shaped like this spectacular auditorium and the seats will be, you know, pillows on the floor and they'll give you the right drug and whatever <laughs> microchip in your head will start going and the movie will be all around you and you'll be in it and pressing hyperlinks and all that stuff. And, and you know, great. It'll be fabulous. It'll be wonderful. Uh, but uh, the overwhelming power, I mean, film has been working and working. There are still filmmakers who make films that are deliberately anti-illusionistic that call the theatricality. I mean, that's why I love what Mike Nichols did with Angels in America, because Mike is a filmmaker who loves reminding you that it's all kind of pasted together and made up. Yeah. He's a theater, you know. But a lot of film that I really adore is moving towards a more and more and more completely, overwhelmingly powerful illusion that it becomes harder and harder to, to distance yourself from. And that doesn't lessen its power as art, but I think it may change the way that it's, you know, I think it's why perhaps in the modern era anyway, film has become the thing that we're, film and television have become the thing that we're afraid of, sort of supplanting reality. A um, long time ago, people used to say the same thing about theater, but they don't anymore because something better in terms of supplanting reality has come along. The archaic engine of theater of mimesis and you know creating these representations, I think is a, it's a model of human consciousness that I can't imagine will ever be improved upon, and it's essential for us. That's why we go and watch it. Well, so. Shakespeare also said our revels now are ended, uh, and <laughs> we are out of time. Uh, but thank you all very much thank for coming. You. Thank you, Senator Krishna.